truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. The angle has landed. In science, there are many things that are considered the final frontier of exploration, the depths of the ocean, the vast unknowns of space, the uninhabitable deserts and tundras. In medicine, one of these final frontiers is the brain. Jacob Robinson, the head of Robinson Labs at Rice University, is here with us today to help us know what we don't know about the human brain and explain what we do know and share his groundbreaking technology. He first joined me at my fourth annual Healthcare Innovation Summit in Houston to discuss his DARPA-funded research with brain-to-brain communication and how it evolved to treat mental health disorders. Jacob, thanks for being on. My pleasure. Great to chat again. So uh, I'll read a quick uh, uh, bio for you, and we'll we'll jump right into it. I think there's a lot of interesting things to talk about on this one. Uh, You're Associate Professor in Electrical and Computer Engineering and Bioengineering at Rice University and Adjunct Associate Professor in Neuroscience at Baylor College of Medicine. Uh, You use nanofabrication technology to create miniature devices to manipulate and monitor neural circuit activity. I received a a bachelor's in physics from UCLA, PhD in applied physics from Cornell, postdoctoral research uh, in the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology at Harvard, and created a silicone nanowire device to probe the electrical and chemical activity of living cells. So got quite the uh, expertise here. There's, there's a lot more to this um, and you know, various accomplishments and awards. And uh, we met because I was touring your, your facility at Rice. Um, so maybe we'll start there. And, and, uh, and, and look, I want to I hit a few things on this conversation. One, you know, Neuroscience 101, uh, what, what do people need to know? What is what in, in a short amount of time? Uh, I, I think uh, we sent you some questions to, to think about on sort of the mind body problem, the, 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 the nature of consciousness and what that even means, what we know, what we don't know. Um, but, but first, let's talk about your lab at Rice and, and what were you showing me there? Yeah, when you stopped by, I, I was showing you some of the work that we're making, uh, you know, work that we're doing to make progress on, on battery free devices that could be implanted in the body to stimulate record activity of the brain uh, and the nervous system. Um, what was special about what we were making is that, um, you know, if you think about traditional electronics, you know, like your phone, right, it's kind of big and it's big because it has a big battery in there so it can last a long time. And the same thing, are things that, uh, same thing is true of things that we put in our body, right? A pacemaker is pretty big, but most of it is actually battery, right? So now imagine that what we were putting in our bodies were electronic devices with no batteries, then they could be really tiny. And if we can make these really tiny things, these really tiny things might be implanted into the brain in a way that would be a minimally invasive surgery. And so we can then think about a way that we could instrument our bodies so that they could perform better. We could treat disease, we could monitor your neural state, but without having all this big clunky electronics inside of our body. So I was showing you some of the technologies that we're making so that we can transfer energy directly through the body to power these devices with no battery. Okay. And, and, and that's, that's fascinating. I feel like you could make me a, a, an eye that could light up. <laughs> One of the problems yeah. we've had with, uh, with everybody's like, you should get a Terminator eye, Dan. And I was like, well, I don't make them. Um, you seem like the kind of guy who could figure that out. Yeah. You could put a, a small led light. And because the question is always, how do you recharge it? Also, how does it withstand really high temperatures? Because to bake a prosthetic eye, you have to, it has to go in an oven. Um, and, and, and bake the uh, ceramic sort of in, into the mold. So maybe we can figure that out uh, at some point because it, it, it's in high demand. There's a lot of people out there that want light up eyes, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> so no uh, joke, but no joke, I am working with a company that's trying to develop technologies to place in the eyes so that you could get basically uh, AR or VR experiences d- directly stimulated into the optic nerve. So it's coming. I hope so. I mean, so that would be a cure for blindness and, and it could be, because mm-hmm. isn't, isn't that the real, the real impediment to, to curing blindness is we just don't understand how, how that, how that process happens from, from your retina to the optic nerve, to the brain. Yeah, absolutely. Some things I think that, that is underappreciated is that 
the retina is really a part of the brain. So as soon as information moves from the retina to the brain, there's already been a lot of information processing that happens. And so by going directly into the brain, it's actually pretty difficult to think about restoring vision. Uh, and so there is interest in trying to make devices that could directly interface to the, to the retina kind of earlier in that signal processing cascade. Yeah, and I've seen some of those experiments where but you still have to have a retina, I think, don't you? Mm-hmm. Um, and and they've been successful in, I don't know, making it kind of look like the matrix, I think is how they describe it. So, so you, you sort of see the outline of objects with sort of little dots. I mean, it's pretty lo-fi, but is there is there any hope? What about people with like missing eyes like me? Is, that, is, there, is there any yeah. hope there? Because my optic yeah, nerves definitely. are still intact. Yeah, so so you could think about going to the optic nerve, but also there are people working on going directly to visual cortex, right? So after information goes to the retina, it goes down the optic nerve, it goes to the you know the part of the brain uh, in the back of your head. If you stimulate that part of the brain in particular patterns, you can create um, these sensory percepts or basically visions um, that are very low fidelity, like you mentioned, but as we improve the technology to be more precise in how we stimulate and the ways that we stimulate, we can hopefully approach the idea of being able to create more realistic like visual experiences by directly stimulating the brain itself. Okay, so, so uh, you, you left out one of the, the most interesting parts of the lab tour, which was the whole brain to brain communication thing. So what, what are you mm-hmm. guys working on on that front? Yeah, so uh, one of the things that we had wanted to do with DARPA was um, to be able to create this interface of the brain that wouldn't require any surgery um, and would allow you to communicate information directly from your thought to another soldier's or uh, brain. Alternatively, you could imagine communicating with a drone or an autonomous vehicle directly with your thoughts. And that was kind of the, the mission of what we wanted to do uh, with DARPA and the idea that, well, we want to be able to do this with all, w- without implanting something directly into the brain. We wanted something that was like injectable. So what we've been doing is coming up with ways that um, we can use magnetic fields and lasers, actually, uh, optical techniques to stimulate and record activity in the brain um, and then to be able to de- decode that information, understand what it is that that person one day would be perceiving. Now we're not doing these experiments in people, we're doing them in animals, but we have a a mouse in our lab. We're showing that mouse a picture of something and we're trying to decode from the brain activity. What is that mouse looking at? And then to transmit that information to another mouse across the street over at Baylor Mm. and have that mouse perceive the same thing that the mouse in my lab is, is perceiving. That's wild. Okay. So what, how successful have you been so far? Um, and let's break this down. So to, to what fidelity can you tell what the mouse is seeing? Is it just whether the lights are on? Is it what colors are, is he seeing? Um, is, is it actual images? I mean, how, uh, what point are we at? So where we're at with the mouse is we can project something on the right side and the left side, and we can tell whether it's left or right visual field. We can also add other stimuli, like a touch stimulus or, um, or, or an auditory stimulus. We can play a sound. And we can decode from the brain activity where whether the animal heard something, saw something, felt something, and if what it saw was on the left hand side or the right side. So it's not super high fidelity, right? But one thing I want to point out is that the mouse brain is super tiny. It's about the size of your thumbnail. Mm-hmm. And all that information we're decoding is from that tiny thumbnail. Now, if we were to take that same technology and apply it to an animal with a larger brain, like a human or a non-human primate monkey, then we would be able to decode much more robust activities. And that's what we're trying to do now in the next phase of the DARPA program is to work with non-human primates, show them videos and be able to see if we can actually decode what image that animal is looking at, but we wouldn't be able to do in a mouse because the brain is too small. Yeah. And now all the conspiracy theorists are, uh, are, are feverishly <laughs> writing this down as you talk about implanting things in their brains and reading their thoughts. What I tell people is, trust me, the government doesn't care what you're thinking or writing to your friend. Like, they just don't care. 
I, I know you, I know you'd like to believe you're important enough that they care, but they don't care. Uh, it's just, it's not how it works. Um, yeah. All right. But, but that, that's fascinating. I mean, um, and, and you can see is, is so many, you can definitely see the secure communication side for, you know, special operations use um, like that. What, what other, I mean, what other potential uses uh, do you see? So one thing that we were really interested in is the idea of being able to communicate more rapidly than you could with um, mm -hmm. touch or with voice. Yeah. So anytime you, you want to say something, right, I have to transmit that information from my brain to my mouth. I have to move the muscle. The muscle has to move. That's kind of a slow process. What if we could, what if you or you know, a warfighter in the field could communicate their thoughts directly with their autonomous vehicle and have it operate much more rapidly without having to type or control or move something mm. around with their fingers? Right. So st still in the, in the military use. It reminds me of um, a scene from uh, one of the Marvel movies where uh, Tony Stark makes Spider-Man his own like suit and, it's, and, it, and Peter Parker gets into it for the, for the first time. And he's like, Whoa, what is, man, this thing is so intuitive. Like it's reading my thoughts. And it's like, so it's a very, it's a very Tony Stark type um, type technology, you know, where it's, it's intuitive, you know, and, and, and you, you can mm -hmm. imagine now, again, do you really want something reading your, your brain thoughts? You know, I don't know. And, and how do you control that? Because your mind is kind of chaotic. You know, your, your mind is, is all over the place. And so is there, is there any kind of machine that can properly read that? I guess that, I guess that remains to be seen. Yeah, I certainly hope so. You know, and, and you mentioned the military application I and mean, to be, to be clear that, you know, this started with a, as a DARPA program. So it was really geared toward, you know, applications for the warfighter. But one of the things that we found is that as DARPA sponsors these things, we find all these other applications for them, right? Like, you know, if you wanted to stimulate the brain so that, um, you could see whatever it is your drone is seeing, right, very rapidly. Well, that's great for the theater of war, but it could also be used for blind patients, right? And so what we're discovering is that these things that start out as, as military applications have tons of applications in the civilian sector, particularly for, for health, and wellness, um, mental health, et cetera. Right. Um, and look, it gets to the, the general complexities of the brain, and maybe we could talk about that for a little bit. I mean, what we know, what we don't know. Like I said, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you maybe for a quick, a quick crash course on brain 101. Um, you know, how, how should we think about the, the brain and what do we know? What don't we know? Oh my God. Um, so, so we, we only have a short period of time. I'm not going to be able to tell you everything. I mean, first of all, I don't even know everything we know about their brain. I mean, it is, um, it's such a rapidly moving field that even the people at the forefront are learning things all, you know, every day. So, you know, what I would say in, in kind of brain 101 is that um, information that we're perceiving from the outside world gets converted into electrical signals and chemical signals by the cells inside of our brain. And so every thought, feeling, um, and experience that you have is somehow encoded in that pattern of electrical and chemical activity. So we know that. Now, the details of it is where things start to get kind of fuzzy. Where in the brain are these thoughts and feelings located? It used to be that we thought that there was like a one part of the brain that was associated with each kind of function. Like, a, this is a visual part of the brain. This is mm -hmm. the cognitive function part. And we're discovering that it's real fuzzy, that actually, Oh, your entire brain is often involved in all of these processes. One right. part of the brain might be more active than another, but um, overall, there's some kind of architecture like similar to a computer architecture. There's information that's being passed electrically and chemically, uh, and there are a number of parts, different cell types. Think of them like components in your computer. We don't even know how many there are. There's an active research um, initiative to try to basically count the different types of brain cells in, in our brain. And so we'll learn that soon, but there's a lot that we're, we're still uncovering. And we're not even sure how to, how to sort out and classify all the different neurons in the brain either. And, and what do you even Correct. mean by electrical and chemical communication? You know, it's, I think we sort of understand that when we talk about a computer and ones and zeros and some combination of ones and zeros means something, but mm -hmm. how, how does, how does that work? Do we even understand how that works in the brain? I would say the short answer is no. Um, the long answer is that we have lots of theories and I think we have parts of the answer. For example, um, most neuroscientists 
subscribe to the idea that the information is encoded in basically how fast the brain cells are firing. So it's not ones and zeros in the sense of a binary code, but it's more of what they call a rate code. So like these more active neurons are um, encoding their activity based on the number of times that they're sending that signal. But it's much more complicated than that. Um, and one of the things that's different between the kind of ones and zeros picture that we have of the way a computer works is that the communication might be encoded in these rates, basically the number of uh, spikes that you get or, or voltage pulses that you get from one of these neurons. But at the same time, it's dumping out chemicals. And those chemicals kind of spread out kind of throughout the brain. And so in addition to that rapid communication that we have in the brain, we have these slow active forms of communication. And these neuromodulators affect your mental state. So as you feel awake and alert, afraid, um, tired, bored, whatever it is, those are these slow acting changes. So even though the signals might be the same, your mental state has changed because of the chemicals that are going on in the background, ebbing and flowing slowly throughout your day. Yeah. And, and then there's like a, pro a processing side to this. So, so, I mean, you know, you're sending signals maybe based on what sensations come our way, what, what sensory, uh, I guess sensory factors are going into the brain and that's one thing. And, you know, and if you're a very simple animal or insect, you know, it's like, there's some programming that you react a certain way when you feel something, right. If you're a fly yeah. and you feel something, you fly away. Like it's very yeah. predictable, very predictable. Yeah. But with humans, it's, it's quite a bit more complicated than that. And we have this whole, we have this whole consciousness thing. And yeah. is there, is there, do, are we even close to understanding what that is from, from a physiological standpoint? I would say that it is, at, okay, my bias here, but from what I understand of our tools and our scientific knowledge, it is almost an intractable problem. So it's such a difficult question to answer and it's such a basic level of understanding uh, the way that the brain works. Approaching consciousness is, is really, really hard. One of the things that I think about, you know, you mentioned this analogy of flies, which I, I really like it. You know, when a fly, we kind of have a map of how all the neurons are connected. And you're right. So if I touch a fly, I expect it to move and it's going to beat its wings based on, you know, the circuit that it can draw out. You mentioned humans are more complicated, right? You don't know how they're going to respond, right? You could poke one person and they run away, poke another person, they punch you in the face, right? Flight, <laughs> fight or flight, that'd be different. And it's not just different from one person to the next. But it could be different for the same person, right? Like at different you times, poked yeah. it, and you run away. You would poke another time. You punch, you know, and and so it's unpredictable even for that same person under very similar circumstances. And so what I think is interesting is then, you know, how do we capture this idea of like why do people behave differently? Is this a, a free will question, or is it just the chaotic system of the brain and? You know, sometimes this is the output you get and another time you get another output and just it's just impossible to predict because it's so complicated. You never get the same output twice. Yeah, well, maybe, maybe this is a good time to talk about the, the leading theories of consciousness. Um, I, I kind of wanted to save this for the end, but we're, we're here and we can other, we can we can hit some of these other subjects as we go go on. But so there, there's four leading theories of consciousness. Is this even right? Neural correlates of consciousness. Is that, no is that correlates, said correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Global workspace theory, integrated information theory, quantum theory. All right. Which one of those do you like best? Uh, so I like the neural correlate theory. So I'll, okay. If you just want to like, you know, shoot the stuff for a little bit. Um, I think that, that what I think is the most compelling argument for me is that if we break down what's happening inside of our brain, it's, it's a very simple process to some extent. There are brain cells, they create an electrical impulse. That electrical activity gets sent to the next cell. It also dumps out a bunch of chemicals. Right? And that's it, right? And now the brain is just a collection, a very large collection of very simple elements. And so what we think about in terms of this neural correlate is that anything that we experience as a sense of like consciousness or free will is just a complicated 
uh, effect of what are very, very simple processes. So analogy that I can maybe bring here is that, um, you know, you're, you're, you're from Texas and so you've had some experiences with hurricanes, right? So like, you know, we all seen the radar maps, this big thing moving around in a circle and we could be like, why is it moving in a circle? How does it know to spin in this direction? There's no consciousness. It's just the interactions of all of the water molecules following very simple rules just happen sometimes to form this very ornate or orchestra of movement. And the same thing could be happening in our brain, right? We take a step back and we see all of these amazing things that humans can do. And we're like, wow, what is this ghost in the machine? But it could just be what happens when you have all of these very simple processes, but you just have so many of them operating together that you get what are called these emergent properties, these things that appear to have very complex behaviors, but the underlying mechanisms are actually quite simple. Does, does, does that solve any of our problems though? I mean, is that, is, does that solve the mind body question? You know, this, cause the, the, this question of what's the relationship between the conscious mind, like this really esoteric concept and, and the physical electrochemical interactions. I mean, it just seems like humans are way too unique to just, to just say, well, it's, it's a bunch of chemical interactions. Um, and so I, I don't know. I, it, it, is that, is that even, is that even coming close to answering our question? It, it, it might be an observation of how it works. Right. And I always tell, I yeah. always like, this, this is a, a kind of a critique I have of in, in general, when we look to science to explain things. And I'm not really sure that's what science is doing. Science is observing and describing. And so mm-hmm. what you're describing there is it's a description of maybe what, what's happening, but it doesn't explain anything. It doesn't explain like, <laughs> How, how we how we think for ourselves how we how we construct that next sentence how we decide to to be in a bad mood today or not be in a bad mood today mm-hmm. because it's so unpredictable it can't possibly be because in theory if it was just this neural correlate kind of like a hurricane I mean because in theory we could we could easily predict a hurricane if we knew if we we've had a computer capable of 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 looking at each and every element of that storm so the same with the brain but we really it doesn't seem like we can um Except in except in the recent um, seasons of Westworld, they they yeah. apparently can, <laughs> but, but but even then it was it it's even then they didn't go as far as to say that free will was was um, no longer a thing. It was just highly predictive, and so you know I don't know. Yeah, I I really like what 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 you said there about being able to predict a hurricane because I would actually you know push back a little bit on that. Um, we can predict a hurricane reasonably well, right? But, you know, I know, and you know, three or four days out, you're not really sure where it's going to make landfall. And it's not because we don't understand physics. It's because it's so complicated that we just, we don't have the computational power. So if I had a good enough computer, we should be able to actually predict where a hurricane is going to hit two weeks in advance, right? Right. And I would argue that, that same thing happens in our brain. If we had a good enough computer that could simulate everything that's happening in the brain, we could predict what people are going to do, but it's just so complicated. Just like a hurricane is so complicated. We can't really predict it very far in the future. Yeah. So I, I, I take it you're not super spiritual or are you? Oh, interesting question. Yeah. So I was raised Catholic. Um, I now consider myself more agnostic, um, but I think it's a really... You know, I think there's room in there for, um, you know, spiritual powers to, to play a role in this, but I don't think you need it, if that's the question. Well, it's certainly a question, uh, and not one we're close to answering. Um, but are you familiar enough with the other theories of consciousness to kind of explain them to the audience? So there's like the, glo- the global workspace theory. Um, mm-hmm. And as I'm reading about this, it Again, these things don't explain much, though. It's just sort of a, it, these, these seem to be just ways of thinking about consciousness and describing it. Yeah. As far as explaining it, I, like I'm religious and I, I, I think the only way to explain it is that it's, it's, like, it's like the last drop of life force after, after God creates the, the, all, all, every single molecule in your body. You don't work mm-hmm. without that extra, that extra oomph. 
So it sets us mm-hmm. apart from literally every other living being. Um, I think you can go back to Genesis and say, that was the moment we received consciousness. Like that, that mm-hmm. was the moment we sort of woke up from it. That, that was, it's not like we were just appeared on the earth. I think there's, I think there's room for evolution and, and creationism all at once. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, I just, I think it's hard to explain it any other way. Um, yeah, I, but, I agree with, yeah, I think that there is, there is room for spirituality and science to coexist, even in neuroscience and even in these discussions that, that we're having. Um, you know, one thing that you brought up, which I think is, is interesting, is the idea that consciousness is unique to humans. I'm not, I'm not sure that that is a, is a consensus opinion among scientists. I think, you know, when you, when you have, you know, animals in your life, you know, to certain, there's some level of consciousness I would probably prescribe to some of my, my yeah, that, you know, that's, my, that's my fair. Not all that's my fair. dogs, but some of them. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I my dogs are very smart. I, I would, I would agree with you there. It's not, it's not purely human. But it's, just, it's a much lower level, but it's there's something there. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And so I think um, it's in the spectrum. You know, there's opportunities to have higher levels of consciousness and lower levels of consciousness. It's not like a binary on or off. Right. Right. It, it, and that's fair. And, and but again, we just we don't know. You know, we we don't know what their emotions are like. We don't know what their thoughts are like. How would they articulate their thoughts? It's just uh, something we, it's kind of fascinating. Um, Yeah. Maybe uh, one thing I was going to ask you, actually. So you mentioned this idea of does it explain anything? And it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that. What is it that you think you're looking for from science to be able to explain when it comes to human behavior and consciousness? Well, it's kind of like the, it's the philosophical concept of the immovable mover. So science mm-hmm. goes one layer deep and one layer deep after that. And then a few years later, we go another layer deep, but there's always another layer, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and so at a certain point, you need to explain where it came from. You, know, you, can, you can go, uh-huh. you can, maybe, maybe, we, maybe we finally come up with some grand unifying theory of physics and we figure out gravity in the end, we're still just describing the world that we observe, right? It's still a description and it's predictive. We have predictive models. Like we understand how things work. We know what they're going to do. But what I'm saying is it doesn't explain why those are the rules. Why are those the rules? Why, why is the universal constant, the universal constant? Why does water boil at a certain point? Like why? There's not a Mm -hmm. really solid reason for that. And I don't think you can ever explain it. I, I think you, yeah, I think you have to look upward to to come up with that explanation. That that's what I mean by it. Yeah, I totally agree, and I think that you know, looking to science to answer the why question, it, you're never going to leave satisfied. Sorry, Dan. Um, you know, I think you can come to us and and ask the how question, right? Like how do how do things work? But if you want to get the, that that layer deeper, I think you do have to cross cross over into that spiritual level. Um, and this is maybe where you, you approach this interesting thing of consciousness, because that's right almost where science and that spiritual tend to meet. And so it's an, right. interesting, it's an interesting line there. Yeah. And I'm not sure we ever explain it. I think we, I think we continue to understand it better and maybe right. allow, that allows us to manipulate it better and, and do really cool things in, in medical science like, like you guys are doing. But I, I don't know where it goes from there. You know, we'll, we'll always be searching for, for some better explanation and we'll be sad when we don't find it. Um, right. But, but uh, is, you know, what are, what are some other opportunities in this, in the neurotech field? Um, what other technologies are you excited about that, that you've seen that, that the public might want to know about? Yeah, I think what a, a couple of things that I'm, I'm excited about are that, you know, I kind of paint this picture that there's a lot we don't know, which is true, but we know vastly more today than we did 10 or 20 years ago. And it's because of um, programs through um, NIH, for example, that have funded a lot of neuroscience research over the last couple of decades, Mm -hmm. um, that we might not be able to answer these why questions that you bring up, but we kind of are beginning to understand where in the brain we might be able to stimulate um, and record from to affect things like mood and memory, um, particularly when it relates to disorders like depression or Alzheimer's disease, et cetera. 
And so we're beginning our, to be able to address these mental health challenges that have been really hard to tackle with drugs. And it's coming through the ability to have these new technologies that we were kind of talking about at the beginning to stimulate particular patterns of activity in the right parts of the brain to kind of restore the balance of those networks. Um, and what you're seeing is that because we have this foundational uh, knowledge base, industry is starting to pick up. So you're seeing companies start to commercialize neurotech products to try and uh, address some of these mental health issues. I think that's really exciting. And, and I think we're going to see this as a new technology wave. There is the internet age, there's an age of bio, um, uh, kind of bioengineering, genetics. There's going to be a neurotech wave that's going to come because we're going to have these tools armed with that knowledge to help uh, improve the uh, human experience. Yeah, I mean, at the, I don't know if this is the one, the, the summit that you spoke at, but it might have been that one or it might have been another one, but um, we had, a, I think, Spark, Spark Biomedical uh, yeah. showcase there neurostimulation device, which it's not an implant, you know, it's still, still exterior to the, to the brain, but, um, very successful in, in let's not say curing people of their addictions, but, uh, but, but diminishing their side effects and their, their cravings to such an extent that they just, they feel fine. Um, yeah. pr pretty incredible stuff. And so you can imagine a, a ton of applications. I've heard of other companies doing uh, similar work as well. So is that what you mean mostly by neurotech or well, it's also, it's also the implants that you're talking about that can. Yeah. Also the implants. Um, so external stuff, implanted stuff, um, things that could restore lost sensory functions, um, not just sight, but um, also the ability to um, for paralyzed people to interact with their computers more mm -hmm. naturally. And then, you know, mental health, like I said, I think is something that we're beginning to get a handle on. Um, Spark is an example of this, right? It's, it's addressing this, this addictive behavior. Um, I think depression, which is a huge unmet need, is something that we're beginning to get a handle on. So I, I see basically neurotech becoming a form of medicine, you know, kind mm -hmm. of like how pacemakers are a form of cardiac medicine. We're going to see neural stimulation as part of mental health. And, and I imagine a lot cheaper, right? Than, yeah. than prescriptions and 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 treatments. Um, so I would I would hope that's a, in our future too is uh, cheaper healthcare. Uh, okay, a couple of bonus questions before we before we uh, wrap this up. Uh, is it true that we only use ten percent of our brains? No, that you always hear. That's <laughs> not true. <laughs> I'm sure there are people out there that use 10% of their brain. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, I know. I yeah, no, definitely. I see them on the internet <laughs> all the time. <laughs> no, we use our brains. Otherwise, it wouldn't have them. It wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> where did that come from? Does anybody know where that myth came from? I, I had looked into this at one point. It's it, it's some longstanding um, kind of uh, fallacy that has just perpetuated. Because it's, it's nice to believe that we can somehow unlock... 90% of our untapped potential, but it's, it's just not true. Yeah. Yeah. Like so many other things I see on the internet that people just, uh, well, I've, I saw it repeated so many times on the internet, so it must be true. Be true. What part of our brain, yeah. what part of our brains are we using when we, when we fall for stupid stuff like that? <laughs> <laughs> Probably all of it. <laughs> oh, um, all right. Uh, uh, <laughs> next question. Uh, do, do you believe in telepathy? Uh, I'm going to say 80% no, 20%. I'm, I'm holding out hope that there's some ability to communicate that we just haven't tapped into. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. Me too. I kind of like the, the idea of it. I don't know how familiar you are with um, a lot of the research the U.S. government did in the 80s with the Stargate program. And there was, a, there was a lot of at the Stanford Research Institute. I mean, they had these guys doing remote viewing and they the Army had an, an entire project where they were training army officers to be remote viewers, meaning, you know, they give you a target, very vague target, and they tell you to sketch it out and, and see what you see. And, and you should really have a 0% success rate if it's not true. Right. But they, yeah. but they don't have a 0% success rate. Like they, you know, they, they, they nail some, some things. And, uh, I, I'm fascinated by that. There's, there's a really interesting, I could never get her on the podcast. Uh, she's a journalist, Annie Jacobson. 
she wrote a book called Phenomena that you might enjoy this one. <laughs> this is, it's all, it's all just, it, it's all documented. This is all real. This is all declassified. Um, you know, she's just a journalist kind of uh, like going through all of this nonsense again. Do I, do I believe it's real? I'm not, I'm not so sure. Um, you know, I'd, I'd want to, I'd want to go through some rigorous scientific testing and like, see, see if you see if they can get just one target correct, you know, cause even that would be pretty damn impressive. Um, but, uh, it's, it's just, it's interesting. It's interesting. Wow. And maybe, and maybe they're full of it. I don't know. Still haven't figured that out. Yeah. I feel like with your access, Dan, you should be able to look into this and, and, and answer this question for yourself. Well, I mean, there's a lot out there already. Like it's all, it's all out <laughs> there. <laughs> it's just, yeah. you know, it's just how much time do I have to really go down these rabbit holes? I don't know. Fair I don't enough. know. Not, not, not enough. Apparently, yeah. um, uh, Jacob. Thanks so much for for being on. Thanks for your work. I think uh, you c- it could lead to um, benefits for millions, and that that's really important stuff. So thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dan. Always a pleasure to chat with you.